Good morning, everyone. Good morning, particularly to those of you at the back who are so excited to be back in RCSI. It's a real pleasure to be back in person, something we have missed so much over the past two years. And the pandemic has brought about many changes in healthcare, the outcomes of which will be the subject of your deliberations today. One change, of course, is in the way we communicate. And as many of you will be participating in the conference today by remote access, I've no doubt that the hybrid conference format is something that is here to stay. And with that comes the opportunity for so many more to participate. So to all of you virtually present, I also say uh, a warm welcome. My thanks to Prof Jan Sorensen and Eunan Friel for bringing together an excellent faculty to discuss COVID-19 responses and population health. I'm especially delighted to welcome our uh, first speaker, Professor Ed Gregg, head of RCSI's New School of Population Health, to his first major speaking event in RCSI. Uh, and Ed, it's great to see you. Uh, I'm also delighted to see Rory Brewer. Rory is joining us virtually, I think. Um, and to welcome Dr. Andres Tegnell, who will give the Swedish perspective on the public health response to the pandemic, which was slightly different from ours, and it'll be interesting at the end of the day to distill which approach was the best. Later speakers will reflect on the broader aspects of uh, COVID on healthcare, in particular surgical and cancer services. The sad fact is that the pandemic has laid bare infrastructural and staffing deficit, long known about, but now brutally exposed. And finally, Mary Day will lead a roundtable discussion on the learnings from COVID, and there are many. We in Ireland did very well in terms of excess mortality due to COVID, published last month in The Lancet, 12 per 100,000 compared with 140 per 100,000 across Western Europe. And we did that because politicians and public listened to urgent public health care advice. Surely the most important lesson as the pandemic wanes is for those in charge of healthcare policy to continue to heed evidence-based healthcare advice. And with these few words of welcome, I'm pleased to thank Dr. Audrey Dervaloy, country president of Novartis, our sponsor today, and thank you, and to invite Dr. Dervaloy to uh, join me here for some words of welcome. So good morning, uh, everyone. It's my uh, great uh, pleasure to be uh, with you in person. So thanks uh, for the invitation. And thank you uh, for giving me uh, the opportunity uh, to be part of this uh, welcoming uh, this morning. This is a very important uh, conference. It's uh, our great pleasure at Novartis uh, to sponsor uh, this conference today. Of course, you know, the uh, healthcare system play a huge role uh, both in fighting and preventing uh, this uh, COVID and our society was uh, forced to make choices uh, during this pandemic, which will have uh, lasting impacts. So the pandemic uh, means that many people postponed, unfortunately, or were not able to attend medical appointments during this crisis. We have yet uh, to quantify the effect of reducing preventive cancer screenings and of course delays in diagnosis and treatment for chronic disease in the Irish populations. We have now facing a tsunami of chronic disease issues and we have to address this chronic disease and met needs. We need to reimagine our approach to healthcare. Of course, one of uh, the positive which came from this pandemic was the faster uptake of digital health technology and 
software platforms, new devices, and it's important that we use all this artificial intelligence to improve detection and treatment. Also, one of the positive is the public and private partnerships, and private and partner, uh, private partnerships can be a powerful way to solve world, uh, large scale healthcare challenges. In the framework of a public-private partnership, we can uh, develop a share goal that benefits to the patients, to healthcare systems, and also pool our resources and expertise towards a common goal. But this uh, advance in partnerships should not disappear once the COVID emergency is over. Policymakers need to ensure a supportive policy framework that maximizes the potential for digital and public-private partnerships. I strongly believe that the success in future will depend on our ability to collaborate. Collaboration will also be key to help us to identify system gaps and failures. We need to work together to find the best solutions to address the system gaps and failures. At Novartis, we have already concrete examples of where we can play, where we can impact, and we have concrete promising partnerships, particularly in the area of cardiology. We need to have a good understanding of the long-term impact of COVID in cardiology. This is a particular important in Ireland, where cardiovascular disease is one of the world's number of killer and account for 36% of deaths in Ireland. This is why we consider that we need to impact in cardiovascular disease and it's where we can play and where at Novartis we want to contribute. This is very important for us to fully understand you know, the long-term effect in this area and it's where preventive policies can help to mitigate heat. Novartis is already partnering uh, with healthcare decision makers around the world to reduce premature deaths in atherosclerosis uh, cardiovascular disease, car cholesterol um, disorders. And in UK, Novartis is working with the NHS, supporting a shift to a more prevention-oriented cardiovascular care model to achieve the UK government's goal very ambitious one of reducing up to 150,000 deaths from cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years. Of course, at Novartis uh, Island, uh, we want uh, to have the same ambition and we already started uh, the same journey. We are already collaborating at uh, different levels uh, in the system. We have already very uh, promising partnership uh, with UPMC uh, international healthcare provider, but also with Smart uh, D8 in Dublin. I think we can do more. We want to do more. We want to go further in collaboration. We strongly believe that trust, time, commitment, accountability, and leadership are needed. At the end, we all want the same thing, that is better health for Irish citizens. So to conclude, my call is for action, action for all of us to work together. That is all the stakeholders in health, technology, pharma, medtech, academia, to work together for a modern and sustainable healthcare system. Thank you for your attention, and I wish everyone a fantastic uh, conference today. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all both here in RCSI and wherever you're joining us this morning, you're very welcome. I'm another Audrey. I'm Audrey Carvel, and I'm going to be chairing this event for the next number of hours. And so I'm very grateful to RCSI for inviting me here today. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. And we have a lot to talk about, uh, a lot of very significant issues facing our health service, our health staff, and of course our patients right around the country. We have a terrific lineup of speakers across the morning, people of great experience, great insights, whose opinions and viewpoints will be of tremendous value to this whole debate. 
So we're going to get started now. This first session, which will take us up to just after 10 o'clock, it's going to concentrate really on examining the various responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, the measures that were taken to manage it, to respond to it, in terms of the health needs of the wider population. And we'll be examining those responses both here in Ireland and getting a sense of how we compared with other countries, both in Europe and around the world. So our first speaker is going to address the unanticipated consequences on people's health that the response provoked. Professor Edward Gregg, he is the newly appointed head of the School of Population Health at the RCSI. Over the past three years, he has served as professor and chair in diabetes and cardiovascular disease epidemiology in the School of Public Health at Imperial College London. And before that, he led a multidisciplinary public health research unit for chronic disease at the US Centers for Disease Control Prevention. Professor Gregg. Thank you. Good morning. It's an absolute treat to be here for a number of reasons. First of all, um, after giving talks behind a computer for two years, it's just great to be in person. And I, I don't know about you all, I feel like I've fall, crawled out from under a pile of rocks, and it's really nice to, to have done so. Um, but more importantly, it's great to be in Dublin and, and Ireland and to be, to be working with you all here and, and to be interacting in this session. And, and I appreciate the, um, the honor of being able to start this off. What I'd like to do is start, though, with a couple confessions. Um, as a chronic disease epidemiologist, I worked at CDC for 20 years and very close in, in the next building over from where there were world experts um, talking about pandemic preparedness. And my confession is that I never believed it would happen. Um, I saw 20 years go by. Um, and so this was um, a shock to me that we've actually had this two-year, this event, this ongoing event occur these, these, over these two years. And I think it, there are a number of reasons. I, um, when you work in a big agency like that, even though you're close to experts, you actually find yourself segregated. And I was happy to stay in my lane doing diabetes, cardiovascular, and chronic disease epidemiology and leave this problem to, to those experts. Um, and I had a number of uh, assumptions and maybe um, misconceptions, some true, maybe not, um, about the differences between chronic conditions and infectious. Um, I saw people working in communicable diseases, and I saw that they had reportable disease systems, and we didn't have that. We were jealous of that. Um, they did outbreak investigations that seemed to lead to, to quick response. Outbreak investigations didn't work for us. We tried it with cancer sometimes or, or renal disease, but they generally didn't work. They had very high relative risks. So if they looked for the right thing in their, in their scanning of exposures, it would be staring them right in the face. Whereas we had these very low relative risks and we had to battle through arguments about causality. And they often, at least we perceived, could manage the problems with just a couple very powerful instruments, vaccine, antibiotics. Um, and this could lead to a very action, you know, an action and response that was really rapid and powerful, and this was our perception. Um, we, on the other hand, had to work through prevention and control and action requiring long-term, multi-level action. It was a slog, and sometimes we'd go 10 years and we still weren't sure whether we'd made a difference or not. So these were sort of the, the conceptions that I had um, about the problem, and I can remember when we got the announcement that we were all going to go home and stores were going to start to close. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. This is actually happening. But I'll still stick in my lane, um, keep my head down, and, and, and let the experts do their thing. That was my thinking. But very quickly, we learned that we were all in this together for a variety of reasons, no matter your um, discipline. My area happens to be diabetes, and we, we found out very early that there was this intensive intersection of COVID-19 with diabetes, wherein more than a quarter of hospitalized cases were people with diabetes, 39% of deaths, case fatality was 24%, and what the slide on the, uh, on the right side shows is that the excess risk of death was 50% 
increased over a regular year. This is more than twice what you see in the general population. So this was clearly we had a problem. So um, like it or not, I ended up working in this area as well. And this got me paying attention more and more to the real differences and the similarities and then the unanticipated consequences that followed. Now, one of the obvious differences of what we're used to seeing is how acute and how dramatic this change was. This is from the UK. Um, and if you look over there at the right, that's the one-year increase in deaths in 2020. And those, you can see that essentially in that year, there had not, there, there had not been an, the only years with similar levels of acute change in rate were a war, a depression, a war, and another pandemic. So this gives you an idea of how dramatic the change was. The other observation is that the level of variation is beyond what we usually see in chronic disease. Hundredfold variation in cumulative death rates, tenfold variation in case fatality, fifteenfold variation within groups. This is both um, across countries and within countries. And you can see, um, although it's a bit small, the wide range, at least at this point in time. The other key point here, though, is there's enormous variation by time. So that last slide I showed you was a snapshot. And if we take another snapshot of that at a later point, it may differ. And that's a function of we have multiple waves and responses um, that maybe were successful in early but not later. And it's an indication that we have to take both the current view but also the long view in understanding how to respond and how to quantify what's happened. I think the other dramatic difference, of course, is the level and the magnitude of the emotional, political, and financial, both response and impact that we see with this that was different. Um, I'll just highlight that one uh, photo up on the left. It struck me very early. I remember walking by my surgery, my, my primary care doc in, in London, and seeing the big sign there that said basically, do not come in here especially if you're sick, do not come in here, go home. Um, and w the, the message there to me, as much as I liked my primary care doctor, was I was on my own here, or at least I felt that way at the moment, and it was a reminder that this, or it told us, I think, starkly, that this was a problem that was beyond what the health system alone could manage. The health system was clearly crucial, but they couldn't handle it alone. Um, but then I look a bit further and tried to understand what was, what was happening. And this is where I started to see more similarities. And you see the wide range of responses that started to emerge. Containment and closure approaches, different from closing schools and workplaces, health systems approaches, testing and tracing approaches, facial covering, all the debates, and then the economic responses to try to mitigate and compensate. And then if you look over here and you see the proportion of countries that actually apply these different um, generally recommended approaches, what you start to see is that there's actually not a whole lot of agreement. Um, it's not, wasn't clear to me actually that anybody really knew what they do, were doing, or maybe it was that some really did know what they were doing, but the others didn't agree with them. Whatever the case, this started to feel more like home to me with diabetes, wherein we have this problem that we really don't know how uh, to tackle, or if we do, we don't have um, at our hands or our disposal what we need to do it. Um, the second observation, though, that I had that was another similarity that, that emerged was as I dug deeper, because I was asked to write an article about the relationship of diabetes and, and, and COVID, and to get my head around this problem, I set up a schematic to think about what is the data set, what is the, the information that I would really want to understand this problem. And so to do that, I thought, well, let's start with a denominator. It's usually best if I do that. That's the population at risk. We know that. And then I thought, well, the next step would be we want to know who's exposed, this B box. And then we want to know who's infected, who's diagnosed, who's hospitalized, who develops severe morbidity and mortality. And ideally, if you have all those pieces, you have your denominators and your numerators, and you can calculate what you need in terms of your rates, okay? Um, but as I looked at the, at least the diabetes problem, but I think in other problems as well, what I realized is that virtually all of our data, which was an amazing proliferation of very rapid publications, hundreds telling us about 
hospitalizations, and then what happened if you were hospitalized. But it was virtually all limited to this segment of the spectrum, okay? Um, that's just for the direct effects. When we start thinking about the indirect effects of COVID-19, health service effects, lifestyle, behavior, mental health, all those, we have another set of challenges. So if what we're really trying to understand is the impact of all these approaches that we have, that countries, counties, states, wherever you are, or people are employing, we actually need to know more about that cascade upstream. And this showed me that the limitations in data that I always complained about as a chronic disease epidemiologist, um, that people infectious conditions have the same limitations as well. Um, sometimes they're different. Um, so to bring this to a close here, what, what have we learned from these differences, similarities? And I'd like to propose there's really at least four big ones for me. Some of these are very positive. Um, first of all, there's been a coalescence of disciplines like never before in science around this problem. Secondly, there's been an unprecedented speed of development, studies, dissemination of research that we, I don't think we could have ever pictured happening like that. Um, third, it's been a reminder of the direct, the magnitude, the intimate relationship between health and economics bi-directionally. And then fourth, it's exposed imbalances and weaknesses in our data, data platforms, and ability to quantify the drivers. So what does this mean for us? I think the four big needs really follow from those. First of all, I think we need to capitalize on this coalescence, the public, political, academic engagement, the fact, the profile that it's raised uh, to the public about what we do in population health. Um, secondly, we need to take this opportunity to rigorously study and understand the individual system and policy level factors that have made a difference. And although sometimes some, we, you know, we feel like we may be emerging and coming out the other side, I think we need to take the view here that no, we're still in this. And regardless, we need to understand fully what has happened, not just with an eye towards understanding what's driven the rates, but what's in, what has driven long-term impact of the pandemic on into the future. Um, we need to fill gaps in our international disparities in population-based data, particularly in understanding that cascade that I described, but also understanding the indirect impacts. And finally, um, I think we need to anticipate that whatever happens with COVID-19 um, infection rates, hospitalization rates, that we have had um, a massive shock to the world that is gonna have health impacts completely independent of COVID-19 on into the future. You know, we, we see how a recession in 2008 had health impacts. This is, that was minor compared to this. And I think we need to start to think about anticipating and mitigating, measuring, and then actually preventing those. Um, so I'd like to thank you all again, and I'm looking forward to this, this session today. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Greg. Well, our next speaker is going to talk about the policies that have been implemented here in Ireland from a population health perspective. Professor Ruri Brewer has been a regular contributor to Irish media during the pandemic. He is Professor of Public Health and Epidemiology and Interim Professor of Global Surgery at the RCSI. He spent six years working in Africa in the 80s and the 90s, followed by public health specialist training and 10 years at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. His research interests lie in global and Irish health systems and policy. He's joining us today from the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. Ruri. Uh, thank you, Audrey. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to present on COVID. Regret regrettably, I'm still under that pile of rocks that uh, Ed described. I'm sitting here in Addis hoping that the power isn't going to go any second or any minute now. Um, uh, if, I hope that the slide is on there. You can see from my title slide that I'm going to talk about uh, how um, uh, our population health responses and the politics of COVID were aligned. Um, I'm looking particularly in the first year of, of the pandemic and um, drawing on the NEFIT minutes uh, and also uh, some frantic letters to the Chief Medical Officer to the Minister for Health, particularly towards the end of 2020. 
Um, I do hope during the panel discussion to actually pick, uh, touch on something very interesting that's happening now, from which I think we can all learn lessons, which is the disintegration of a zero COVID approach in, in Shanghai, China. But I'm, I'm going to start um, with, uh, with the uh, slides, just looking at what, what was the nature of the evidence. And um, I, I pose the title here, Making Decisions Before You Have Sufficient Evidence. Um, and uh, I'm going to look at three types of evidence. Oh, this, are the slides up there? So the, uh, the first um, uh, thing to, to point to is um, uh, the application of just the basic principles of communicable disease control, which have been known to us for, for decades uh, around viral transmission. Uh, and the critical thing with COVID-19 was that we quickly realized that uh, transmission of the virus was occurring pre-symptomatically and asymptomatically. In other words, before people had the symptoms, but they might also have, have uh, the virus and be transmitting it, uh, even though they had no symptoms at all. Uh, there was also the importance of droplet spread, and then later we realized the importance of uh, aerosol transmission. And um, the other critical factor was uh, the reproduction rate, how fast the virus multiplied. And we've seen this actually evolve over time, uh, and in that respect, actually get worse. The second type of evidence uh, that we drew on was uh, what could we learn from other countries and what could history teach us? And there had been the SARS-1 um, uh, epidemic in 2003-2004 um, in, in Asia, and uh, that was potentially more serious in that it had a 10% uh, case fatality rate. But the critical difference was that Transmission was only by people who were symptomatic, and therefore we were able to, uh, to quarantine, to isolate, I should say, uh, anybody who had the virus. And, and there were only 8,000 cases or so uh, worldwide. We also learned early on from the experiences from China, the, the WHO trip uh, in, in February, um, and uh, there were many people who talk about the importance of scientific knowledge around um, the development of the vaccine. But I think those of us who were trying to respond and advise and uh, maybe educate the public a bit were just uh, struck by how, how much uh, knowledge was uh, generated and disseminated. But what I want to um, touch on is, is this um, slide here, and it's about the modelling. Modelling was the um, third type of uh, evidence uh, available to us. And uh, I'm not here to teach you about the science now. I'm, I'm sure um, Ed and my, other, and my other colleague on the panel, they would understand the science of this a lot better than me. Uh, but what, what I have the slide up here is to show you that uh, here on the, um, the 16th of March, this was a, a slide from the 16th of March report from Imperial College, which is Ed's uh, previous employer. This was actually the ninth report it had produced Used. And what, what it showed was uh, predicting what would, what would be the impact on critical care beds if we responded effectively or not effectively. Um, the next slide is my last slide, and then I'm just going to talk to some of these issues. And this is a similar slide. This is the first one I, I drew on. You'll see the Department of Health, uh, Government of Ireland, HARP there. Um, I used it in the first presentation I gave to the Irish Global Health Network on the um, on the 16th um, of, of March, no, on the 27th of March, um, and I, I had drawn on it earlier uh, that week. And this was only two weeks after the the uh, the, the closures, the, the the lockdown had been imposed in Ireland. So, uh, what I'm using it to show is that. In as much as politicians across different countries around the world believed in these kinds of models and took action on the basis of them, thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of lives were saved, uh, or if they didn't take action, that was the impact in terms of lives lost. So the conclusion from, from this first theme of the presentation is that we did, countries did have uh, sufficient evidence on which to act, applying the precautionary principle. And uh, the lesson is that scientists need to uh, give decisive advice, even on the basis of imperfect evidence, when the uh, potential consequences of not giving that advice could be so serious, and politicians need to respond 
decisively and, and promptly. So um, maybe we could uh, just switch off the slides and just I'll just talk to it uh, now. So how well did Ireland perform? So, uh, well, we did not do well compared with New Zealand and Australia, which, which were uh, island, other islands that imposed uh, quarantines very quickly and decisively. But actually, even Vietnam, which had a long land border with China, uh, managed to keep out the virus completely. Uh, we allowed the Italian uh, rugby supporters arrive in Ireland two weeks uh, after we'd actually postponed the match. That was, uh, they came on the 6th to 8th of March. We allowed our, um, our, our racing pundits travel to Cheltenham from the 10th to the 13th of March, and many of them brought back COVID to Ireland. And then there were the skiing trips. But the question I would ask is, is uh, um, could we have a, uh, imposed effective border quarantines? And some of my public health co uh, colleagues who, who advocated a zero COVID approach, which I didn't advocate, believe we could have. I don't think we could have because of the real politic of where we were, sitting a, in an island with a land border to another country that was not uh, responding to COVID in, in, in a responsible and effective way. We were governed by EU regulations uh, and um, maybe we didn't respond as quickly as we could have. But next time we will know better and EU regulations will need to support uh, what we need to do. So what did Ireland do well? Well, um, the speed of decision making by method, the National Public uh, Emergency Team, uh, and Tishuk um, uh, Vradkar in March. Uh, and that compares with uh, uh, a failure in the UK, which uh, an ex-colleague of mine and, and Ed's, um, uh, Helen Ward, drew attention to in mid-April, which was that a delay of 11 days in the UK uh, between the 12th of March and the 23rd of March. They knew what to do and should have imposed uh, controls. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people got infected and probably thousands of people died needlessly in the UK. And that compared with Ireland, our epidemic was one week behind the UK, but uh, we announced our, our restrictions on the 12th of March. They took effect on the 13th of March. And many of us, I know I was in RCSI at the day, those would be one of those days you remember rather like 9-11 or the death of John F. Kennedy if you were old enough. What did Ireland not do well? Well, uh, like many other countries, we discharged the elderly from hospital into poorly staffed um, uh, nursing homes without PPE equipment. And we should have known better. We, we knew the evidence around communicable disease control. But I want to pick particularly on the second thing we did not do well, uh, and that was um, the third wave over Christmas uh, and New Year, uh, the end of 2020-21. And here, is we, here we see how there was a, a failure of politics. Um, Ireland has a highly populist democracy, as, as we all know, and I would say it was the inability as much as the failure uh, of the government to withstand the popular demand to open the pubs and the restaurants over Christmas, which then resulted in the mixing of older and younger generations over the new year uh, and, and thousands of needless infections and, and hundreds of need, needless deaths. Um, I, I, I have reason to, to read the daily letters from the Chief Medical Officer to the uh, Minister for Health, I was doing some work with the Attorney General about a, a year ago, uh, and it was it was clear that the horse had bolted, and you could see with the models uh, they were increasingly going into the red. It's notable that Philip Nolan two days ago actually said maybe he didn't communicate the models uh, well enough. So, what what are the three lessons then uh, in this presentation? Well, firstly. A, a, aligning popula population health and politics can be difficult uh, in a democracy where the, the interest groups and the desire of politicians to be popular uh, is, is acting against the health of the population. But we did have one thing which I found very helpful in all the articles I wrote, uh, particularly was um, the Amorak surveys, the weekly population surveys that showed that consistently uh, people supported the measures, 
And there were twice as many people saying we should have stricter measures. And we had among the strictest measures in Europe as there were people saying we should relax our measures. So we need to have systems to listen to the people. Uh, secondly, making decisions before you had uh, sufficient evidence. I'm old enough to uh, remember working in the UK in the mid 1990s um, when the HIV epidemic came along and CDSC where I worked produced similar models and people later said they were totally alarmist. But the models, they had very wide confidence into this, but they did alert people that, look, if we did nothing at all, this is going to get worse. And public health uh, uh, professionals are, are never recognised for their successes because they're preventive ones. And, and finally, um, next time, uh, not only do we need to have the legislation in place, our next uh, pandemic may not be another variant of SARS-CoV-2. It could be SARS-CoV-3. It could be a much more pathogenic, a, a more lethal virus than we have uh, at the moment. And we need to be prepared to have much stronger measures in place that will uh, be draconian uh, along the lines of maybe what China is doing, though they're doing it totally ineffectively. And we need to have the community on our side. And that is why over the last year, I have repeatedly called for a citizen assembly so that we can engage the community around what could be coming down the tracks. So thank you. Rory, thank you so much. And thank you to the ESB in Ethiopia for keeping the power going for that. And hopefully, Rory, you will join us in about 10 or 15 minutes to take part in our panel discussion as well. Now, we all know that different countries around the world adopted different responses to the pandemic. And one notable country in the European Union which did that was Sweden. And our final speaker in this session will talk about the Swedish response. Dr. Anders Tegnell was the state epidemiologist of Sweden, the deputy director general, as well as the head of the Department of Public Health Analysis and Data Management at the Public Health Agency up until very recently. He has extensive experience of leading different Swedish government agencies at different levels in the fields of public health disease control and preparedness for health threats. He has also experience from international work from Laos in the early 1990s and from DRC during the Ebola outbreak in 1995. Dr. Tednell, you're very welcome. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, and thanks very much for the very nice uh, invitation to, I think, a meeting with a very good and very important subject that I don't think we really discussed enough. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to, uh, to discussing this further. Um, and the same as Professor Greg, uh, I'm happy to, even if there is not a huge crowd here, to actually meet people. Uh, there's been too many meetings behind this Zoom and others. Uh, so it's very nice to be here. Um, so I'll just try to make a brief introduction in what we try to do in Sweden uh, and try to get rid of some of the myths about what we did and didn't do, uh, which I think is important when, you, when we're now getting into a phase where we're trying to compare what we did in different countries. Um, I think that the first thing we need to understand, which is very much um, connected to what Professor Gregg talked about, and that is the connection between communicable diseases and uh, non-communicable diseases. I mean, that's something which I'm going to be happy to discuss with you further because it's something I've been fighting with for the last 10 years since our agency was um, instituted. And in one of the things that the politicians told us to do was to integrate better between communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases when it comes to many methods of measuring and, and trying interventions and so on. Because what we did become then is a really public health agency with a wide, very wide mandate. And I think uh, when we think back to it, that really in, uh, had a big impact on how we looked at different kind of interventions that we really tried to look broadly at what we could do. So we worked with anything, I mean, my former director said we work from anything with, from snuff to Ebola. Uh, so it takes the whole spectrum under con consideration, uh, not least substance abuse and sexual reproductive health and other areas like that. Uh, so we had that and we had expertise in this many different areas with us when we went into the pandemic and, and tried to figure out what we could do. 
Of course, we also have a very big part of communicable disease control in our mandate. Uh, Sweden is an extremely federal country when it comes to public health and healthcare in general, and the regions actually run everything uh, that the communities don't run. And at the national level, we have very little power to do anything. But in this specific area, we have a very specific mandate actually to, uh, to get all these 20 regions working together. And we do that in many different ways. We have, among many other things, a national database of all the cases. And since everybody in Sweden has an identification number that we can run in all different registers, we can basically see uh, whatever people are, what kind of background they have, what kind of shopping they have done, what movies they were renting recently, and so on, by, by following this identification number as soon as we get ethical agreement to do it. So it really gives us a very powerful um, tool to understand the whole public health impact of different things. Um, so I'm not going to go in, in any detail to how the, the pandemic evolved in, in Sweden, uh, but as in, in most other countries in Europe, it really started uh, with the school holidays in Sweden. Uh, we have skiing holidays in February and March every year. About one million Swedes, out of the 10 million we have as population, leave Sweden during three or four weeks. And some of them go to the Alps, but far from all. Um, so what we found out that we actually could see that there was a pandemic in most of Europe long before uh, most of Europe realized that they had a pandemic ongoing because we got cases back from basically every country in the European mainland and, and US and many other countries before they really saw what's happening there. So we had a huge first wave, very much fueled by these one million people uh, going abroad. Uh, and then actually we, it worked quite well. And during the first summer we had very few cases. And the second wave in Sweden came much later than in many other countries. And then it's followed uh, basically the same. And we had, as many other countries, we now had a huge Omicron wave. Uh, but with very, as you see on the other picture, I think ICU is probably the best figure we could use when we talk about impact on healthcare, because uh, it's most consistent. Uh, we have, <clears throat> even if there was a huge Omicron wave, it did not have at all as big impact on the, on the healthcare system as the previous ones. And the same can be said for, for the mortality, which also much, much lower. During this. this is, of course, partly due to, to vaccinations. You can see here, sorry, it's still in Swedish, the, the dark, the darker staples are actually vaccinated people. Uh, and this shows what we get in communicable diseases when you have vaccinated almost all people. People that are vaccinated tend to become the majority of the people getting sick uh, because there is hardly anybody who is not vaccinated anymore. So we, even when you're vaccinated, um, you get mortality in the elderly groups. So what we try to do, I, I think we've seen these figures a number of times now, we, we try to flatten the curve and uh, minimize mor morbidity and mor uh, mortality as much as possible. But we also try to look at other consequences for individuals. Uh, we focus very much on trying to protect risk groups, and I think we can come back and discuss how that can be done in, in today's society. And we try to tailor measures and interventions. We, we're not going for a complete societal lockdown. Instead, we try to find areas where we really need to close down. Uh, so we close down restaurants to a great extent. We close down m big meetings and so on. And we also wanted something that was sustainable over chance. And basically, most of the measures we had in place were in place most of the time. So we did kind of virtual lockdown, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, so we did a combination of binding and voluntary measures. It, to many, it looks like Sweden had no binding regulations at all, which is not true at all. Uh, we had a ban on visiting nursing homes, uh, distance education for secondary level training. Uh, we banned gatherings more or less as early on as most others. Uh, we enforced physical distancing in restaurants and cafes in, in a number of different ways. And we had travel restrictions and entry bans like most other countries. Uh, but we had very few binding regulations that were directed towards the individual. It, uh, well, these were mostly uh, towards other parts of society. Um, but so we did, towards the individuals, we instead worked with um, recommendations. And that's a big tradition in public health in Sweden. 
uh, we rely on our legal measures. Our legal system also relies very much on that the individual takes this responsibility, which they also did to a very great extent. In repeated surveys, 80 to 90 percent of the population said that they were trying to follow our recommendations. So we told people to work from home, and they did. Uh, 50, 60 percent of the workforce worked from home. Uh, told them to meet as few people as possible. We should also could be very obvious that it did. Physical distancing worked reasonably well in a sparsely populated country like uh, Sweden. Uh, we were hesitant about face masks, but we said let's use them in, in public transport, which is difficult to keep a distance in. Um, we also realized that if we have these kind of recommendations, you need to make it possible for people to follow them. And for example, if you tell people you have to stay home if you have the slightest symptoms, in the, in the morning when you wake up. You need to be economically compensated for that. So the rules around that was changed. So you actually got paid uh, from the first day, which you don't normally do in Sweden. And we also tried to uh, get less pressure on the health services with taking away the obligation to have a doctor's certificate when you stay home. And we also try to protect risk groups by making it possible for them to stay at home if they, even if they couldn't work from home. So a number of things like that need to be... To be. And the public response to, to the strategy was really enormous, I would say. 80% said that they consistently over these two or three years said that they, would, they were following our recommendations. And the public trust in the agency stayed very, very high. And we could also see it in different ways. This is a bit... Uh, mixed picture, but it shows how people have changed their travel behaviors. Uh, we have a lot of data these days, and mobile, mobile phone data is one of, the, one of the interesting ones. And here you can see that the change in travel patterns uh, followed the same pattern in Sweden as they did in the other Nordic countries, in spite of that the other Nordic countries had legal measures in place to stop people from traveling. So by, by voluntary recommendations, we achieved almost the same level as response as others. And we could also see that people actually kept apart, because if you look at other communicable diseases, uh, normally uh, these are the different years and the number of cases per month. Uh, usually we have a lot of uh, communicable diseases during the winter months, uh, respiratory diseases, pneumococcal disease, influenza, but even calicivirus. Uh, but uh, during the pandemic, these more or less disappeared. And uh, this was not due to lack of uh, health care or testing and so on, but actually I think it shows that people kept physical distances. Uh, so we had a lot of containment and mitigation measures very much in line with other countries, uh, but we used other tools to, to get them in place. And I think now when we're getting hopefully to some kind of end uh, of the pandemic, I think we can see that the impact of the pandemic on Sweden are rather similar to, to many other countries. So our excess mortality is, I think, almost as low as the one in, in Ireland. And if you try to, in some way, this is the Oxford Index of measures. Of, of, and I had a talk together with my Dutch colleague. And as you can see, these are a, a way with this index to try to see how much of measures, how much of uh, restrictions you have had in place uh, over time. And as you can see, the green and the blue line follow each other rather similar. So the differences in measures between Sweden and many other countries are not at all as, as big as many thought. In the end, there is a difference, but that was because the, the last wave came much earlier on in the Netherlands than it came in Sweden. So, and then how good are we at doing projections? Um, and I would say that, no, we, we are not very good at that. Um, we have used a slightly different method than, than many others that basically uh, we are using past data and to, to make projections or scenarios for the future. Uh, and that had worked reasonably well, uh, better than, than many others, I would say. And I think right now our uh, modelers think that uh, due to the new variants of the Omicron, we might see another increase of cases again during May. Uh, we will see because there's been an interesting interaction between um, the weather and, and the number of cases in Sweden, much clearer than in many other countries. And hopefully spring will come early in, in Sweden this year and we won't see any rising cases. Thanks a lot.
Dr. Tegnell, thank you very much. Ed, if you would join Dr. Tegnell at the um, at our table here, because we're going to have a discussion now for the next uh, 25 minutes or so, and Rory is uh, joining us still from Addis Ababa. So, Rory, it's good to see you as well. So, we are going to have a discussion. I'll allow a couple of minutes at the end for any questions from either you virtually or here in our lecture hall. So, we are going to deepen the discussion, really, of what we've been hearing from our guests so far this morning and explore the question Questions. What if the pandemic was just one other challenge facing our health system, one of many, many challenges? So that leads to questions like, did it merit the response that it got, given the impact on the wider population's health needs? Or was the response, as Rory suggested, too populist in its approach at times, and therefore were deaths and serious illnesses avoidable? So Ed, I might come to you on that one first. Could it ever be regarded as just one other challenge among many facing our health system? Well, I have to admit, so I have reserved judging at any point. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, in, um, I'm really humbled and in awe of sort of the decisions that people like Anders had to make that I did not have to make. Um, and so I'm curious to hear about, actually about the process. But I think that what we have to do is, um, as I, I think Rory described, the, the, the challenges of taking modeling data, right? And modeling data, by definition, is a, is a, it's a formulation of other pieces of data. It's, it's a construction, and it's only as good as the data going in. Um, and in many ways, everything that we do, all of our data is like that, our, our surveillance data, um, what we understand about behavioral processes, about um, what policies are going to work. And so I think that what happened is, um, for the most part, and I can think of a couple egregious exceptions, but for the most part, leaders did the best that they could given the information available to them. And then gradually, as data became available, we actually responded better and better. And I think that, um, I think the opportunity here is just to learn from from that, that progression of data, um, and then how, and, and really analyze how we make decisions. Ruri, what's your answer to that question? Was it just another challenge facing the health system? Did it merit the response that it got? Well, I think as my, as the Irish uh, speakers, and you know very well yourself, um, what Ireland was facing was perhaps the most overstretched health system in Europe. We had the lowest proportion of critical care beds to the population, uh, great overcrowding. You couldn't even physically distance um, uh, people in the hospital. So if the precautionary principle was to apply, and I've argued that it should, it should apply even more so in Ireland because we didn't have, we didn't have that, that slack, uh, which for instance, the German health system had. Um, I think one of the major things we haven't referred to is the impact on health workers, which is something that I've been researching for the last 12 or 15 years. And yet again, it seems that we're taking them for granted. And maybe just finally on, on, on Greg Ed's point there um, on, on the models. I mean, a good example was uh, actually Imperial's models for Africa were way off. They, 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 they had a, a doomsday, uh, doomsday uh, a kind of view of what was going to happen in Africa. And actually, it's worth thinking about uh, Africa, low-income countries. The impact of the restrictions and the lockdowns in, in, in Africa were far greater than the impact of COVID. But the models were actually pretty good for Ireland, despite... Um, Philip Nolan coming out and saying that they made some errors. I followed them week on week uh, as they were being reported, and generally um, they got it right. But when you're faced with something you don't know how serious it's going to be, you really do have to err on the side of caution. Anders, can I just talk to you for a few moments? Um, what inspired the Swedish approach to the pandemic? Why did you take the approach that you did in the initial months? Mainly because we were following what we normally do, I would say. Uh, this was very much influenced by our 
sort of um, normal way of handling both communicable disease control and, and, and general public health, that we very much, and the, the Communicable Disease Act in Sweden very much emphasizes the, um, that the individual has to take care. That it's very much the individual's responsibility to avoid infecting others. Uh, actually to the level that, that uh, it, it can become a court case if they don't. Uh, so we really followed on that and we really followed on, uh, on trying to use that uh, to get individuals to understand how important it is that they act in a, in a reasonable manner to, to help from uh, spreading the disease. And, and that's why we, we told people to work from home as much as possible. And luckily enough, it's possible in Sweden. Uh, because so many people have uh, that kind of work and, and we have a very developed system for that. So, and that made a huge impact and also that to tell people to stay home uh, when they have slight symptoms, exactly when you start getting infected. And so I think it's still an area where we, we're fighting to understand completely. Uh, we did some surveys in Sweden where we actually went out and tested people in the population who did not feel uh, ill. Uh, but then when we went back to the few positive ones we found, I think we did five or six different surveys and altogether we have maybe 100, 150 people that were positive. All of them actually had symptoms. So yes, you, you have sometimes very, very light symptoms, but, uh, but telling people to stay home the, the least you feel sick in the morning also made a difference. And, and of course we all understand we can never stop all cases from happening. What you need to do is to flatten the curve. You need to get away with as many cases as possible. And um, I think that's really what's, what's behind it. A combination of traditions on how we do things and, and I think an understanding from early on that this is going to be a marathon, it's not going to be a sprint. We are not going to be able to stop this by closing our borders, closing down our societies and waiting for a few weeks and then it will all be over. That will not happen. And I want to come back because you'll be aware of the criticism in particular in recent weeks, um, by a, a, a panel of scientists across Europe which published in Nature. I want to get your response to that. But just on what Anders has been saying there, Ed, um, basing the approach on what they did previously. And hindsight, obviously, is wonderful. And we're all experts now um, on what to do. But when you are entering a global pandemic, which it was, are you starting off at the wrong point by relying on previous experience and, and history to determine your current approach? I would say not at all. That's what you have to do. It's a, you know, if we had stat, know, Bayesian st statisticians, that's, that's a, you start with the information you have. That's the best information you have. Um, and then you adapt as you learn more. You know, a more clear answer to your first question is yes, this w was a significant problem that was different from what we've dealt with before, but I don't think we knew that immediately. It took some time to understand that. Um, but yes, I think that we always start with our, our prior information, our prior experience, and then we have to adapt over time. And I, I think it's kind of, uh, we see a lot of ways that um, there has been an adapt adaptation and learning. Um, and um, I think that the, the, the key issue now is we need to take the long view. We need to take the long view in, in understanding um, what the impact is going to be um, and what we can do. Anders, just on that report, um, which was published in, in recent weeks, it described the Swedish response as unique and characterized by a, quote, morally, ethically, and scientifically questionable laissez-faire approach. And it goes on to say that the Swedish government deliberately tried to use children to spread COVID, that it denied care to seniors and other vulnerable patients. Many elderly people were administered morphine instead of oxygen, effectively ending their lives, that potentially life-saving treatment was withheld without medical examination, without informing the patient or requesting permission. It says that patients with comorbidities were told they couldn't be admitted to ICU on the grounds that they were unlikely to recover. It said that facts around COVID were downplayed, were not revealed, like asymptomatic people being capable of spreading the disease, that it was airborne, that it was a greater threat than flu, that children weren't immune. I mean, the, the, the catalogue 
that they regard of mistakes here is pretty devastating. How do you answer that report and those scientists? Yeah, I've read the report, and it's uh, we. I must say, <coughs> we are a bit surprised that it was published, um, because when you look at the background, I mean, the report. We have to remember the report does not really analyze data at all. It just um, refers to other publications, and I've tested a few of the publications they've gone referring to, and a number of them are uh, articles in the, in, the, in media debate articles, uh, not all based on any kind of analysis either, uh, more on opinions, uh, which is okay, but maybe in an article like this. So, and even the, the, in many ways, quite critical Corona Commission of Sweden said that the overall approach of Sweden uh, was reasonable, and it, it, it turned out that it gave a, a fairly similar effect to the approach in many other countries. They are, the overall outcome in Sweden is not hugely different. I mean, our excess mortality is one of the lowest in Europe, for example. Uh, we managed to keep our health care working, which I agree was one of many very important goals because the health care in Sweden is also incredibly, incredibly stretched, even in peacetime. And the way they managed to reorganize themselves and actually double the number of in terms of care beds, which also in Sweden are very few, uh, was amazing. Uh, but they, they needed the help of keeping the cases down. So it's, it's a very strange report, I would say, because it, it uh, mixes some uh, credible data with a lot of data that does not even exist, and has a lot of opinions mixed with what they, they say is uh, some, some kind of scientific fact. Uh, but, um, yeah, a surprising article in a... In a but the death rate then, I mean, if it, it compares unfavorably with your neighbors, like Norway, Finland, Denmark, they, they say that if, if you had had Norway's death rate, you would have had less than 5,000 deaths rather than more than 18,500. Yeah, I mean, there's two points to that. Uh, first of all, in, in Europe, it's Norway and Finland that's the outliers. Uh, and we need to understand why they are outliers. When you look at excess mortality, the differences are not that great anymore. Uh, they're actually very, very small. Uh, but it's actually Finland and Norway that, that are the outliers, and the rest of Europe and, and Sweden's death rate compared to most other European countries is, is fairly in the middle of the, of the field. Uh, and I think we still need to understand why Norway and Finland um, had such a, to many in, especially Finland in many ways, had such a different kind of uh, pandemic than we did have in Sweden. Uh, there's been some tries to understand this, and you can look at different things. You can look at the part of the population that has a background in other countries, which is hugely different in these countries, much, much higher in Sweden. You can look at crowding and housing, which is very important, uh, also much, much higher in Sweden. Uh, Socio-economic disparities, unfortunately, also much higher in Sweden. So there is uh, a number of... Uh, reasons why um, the death rate in Sweden became different. But I think, as always in epidemiology, you need to be quite careful with, when you discuss what you should compare to. But was your goal herd immunity? No, 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 no. no. I mean, herd immunity is a well-known uh, fact for any epidemiologist. It influences quite a lot how, how a disease spreads. I mean, it influences the R value enormously uh, when it goes up. Uh, the immunity in the population, but we also know that herd immunity, if you understand it in the way it's going to stop uh, disease transmission, cannot be achieved without a vaccine. It has never been achieved without a vaccine. And even with the vaccines we have in, in our hand in today, uh, COVID-19 is not going to, we're not going to achieve herd immunity the way to stop the spread because they're not good enough for that. Uh, we need, you need to understand herd immunity because that would very much influence the impact of the measures you take, because with a high level of immunity, the impact of your measures will be much, much greater. But to have it as a goal is, of course, not neither ethically nor professionally uh, sound. Rory, what was your uh, opinion and assessment of the Swedish approach? Uh, I was just thinking in terms of uh, how compliant the Irish population was. Um, I actually think 
if if we hadn't had uh, legislative controls, we probably would have done quite well. Um, we're seen as being a rather rebellious people. We're not actually. We are remarkably compliant people. Um, now that doesn't mean I, I I actually don't. I actually think what our approach was the correct approach. But I would, I'd like to just take maybe a little bit of a global perspective on this. Um, yes, our, our knowledge uh, has evolved and has improved, and our tools have improved. But the other thing we need to remember is that the virus is also adapting, and there isn't one single correct approach. I mean, we were knocking ourselves, we were beating ourselves up at many times in 2020 and early 21. Uh, and, and now when we look back, I think we see that... Uh, uh, and, and if we compare ourselves with, say, what China is doing now in, in Shanghai, it seems as if our approach was, was the correct approach. Um, what China is doing wrong is they're not cognizant of the fact that uh, the, the, the original, the ancestral virus, the Wuhan virus, had an incubation period, an average of five to six days, with Omicrons down to two days. It had a, a much slower multiplication rate, reproduction rate. It is much faster now. And your response needs to be cognizant of uh, the virus you're dealing with. And that's what is so wrong about what, what uh, China is pursuing at the moment. Uh, you, you can't pursue a zero COVID approach when the virus is transmitting uh, uh, so quickly. In retrospect, our, our approach and that of the Western de democratic countries was try and buy time, uh, suppress the virus as far as possible. As I said, I, I, I never believed uh, elimination was possible for Ireland and give yourself that time to develop the vaccine. There's a lot of le uh, lesson learning we can do from it. But let's not assume the next uh, pandemic that comes along is going to uh, be tackled in exactly the same way as we tackle this one, because you just have to be so cognizant of, of the, the transmission dynamics of viruses. They can be merciless or they can be kind. They can be kind in terms of pathogenicity the way Omicron has been kind. Let's, let's not be complacent about how we're going to control the next pandemic. Ed, you said you were curious to, to hear from Anders about their approach. What, what do you, what's your thoughts now, having heard some of what he had to say? Well, I have to say, so I read about their approach early, never met Anders, and um, I was immediately agnostic to it, in part because I, it, we're, I feel like, and it was apparent already, that managing this problem is a negotiation with the public of some sort that is a different negotiation depending on where you are, right? And um, I spent periods of the pandemic in the UK and the US and in Mexico, and, and I saw how different it is in all three of those places. And that not only is it a negotiation with the public about what we can and can't do now, but it's a calculation about endurance, right? And so I was agnostic to the idea that maybe they know something that we don't know. Um, and, um, but I also like to see the data coming in, so I've, my personal feel is we don't know yet. We haven't seen enough. We have to take the long view and the broad view to really understand what works and doesn't. But that negotiation, it has to be based on honesty? Open well, I think, the facts? yeah, I mean, so I, I think that the one, uh, the, the one place that I will judge, I think the, the egregious, um, you know, when politicians suppress or ignore science for political or economic reasons, I think that that's, um, you know, that's unforgivable. But I think that when public health officials are using difficult, making difficult decisions based on varied science, and it's not, we, and, and what's important here is that there's not a single metric. Yes, death rates, and hospitalization rates tend to be concrete. We can, they're more reliable, um, less noise in them than other aspects of our metrics, but we actually have to view the whole picture, I think, um, to, to, um, to really make the best decisions, and it's a hard thing to do. So, Anders, was that a battle for you at times with the Swedish government, um, politics versus science, uh, populism versus science? Because we had it here at times as well. No, I mean, my impression that it was a lot less of that in Sweden than, than in many other countries. 
maybe because we have a slightly different model of uh, the division of mandates between the agencies and the, and the, and the government. Uh, the agencies are very independent in Sweden, but, but only to a certain extent. They, they live with a mandate given to them by the politicians, and then they decide what they can and will do within those mandates. And, and then the government is not even allowed to interfere in those decisions. So there is a long tradition of, of very close communication between the agencies and, and the political level. And a lot, lot of trust, I would say. So no, um, there was very few instances when there was any kind of disagreement between the political level and the agency level on, on what should be done. But that very much dependent on we were used with dealing with each other, and it was kind of negotiation. I mean, we need to realize that the political level have certain things they need to input before uh, you take a decision. But they also had a, a trust in that we, when we came and said that this is really definitely very, very serious, we need to do this and this, uh, they usually listen. So no, uh, the political level was, yeah, I, I think that was a good collaboration all the way. Rory, you have spoken about China, and they are obviously continuing to implement their zero COVID control measures. Is that the wrong approach in your mind? Ultimately, has the virus defeated us all? There isn't one right approach uh, ever and anon. And I think that is the mistake. I mean, even those who uh, advocated zero COVID in Ireland in 2020, when they saw you know, vaccinations coming along in 2021, saw that it had changed, uh, changed the whole uh, approach. If you look at uh, two other countries that had a zero COVID approach, uh, New Zealand and Hong Kong, um, New Zealand moved very rapidly to uh, high immunization coverage levels, as did most of the Australian states using highly efficacious vaccines. Hong Kong uh, was slow to immunize the elderly. And it's easy now to look back. You have to be very nimble, I think, in dealing with, uh, with this virus. The virus changes, your, your tools change. And, and there was a certain complacency, a certain ultranationalism about the Chinese uh, response. We are superior. They, 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 you know, their, their reputation is so important to them. Uh, and maybe we're also seeing you know, the cult of the political leader, uh, not only in Russia at the moment, but also in China. It's that close alignment uh, of scientists and politicians, which we actually got pretty well uh, right in Ireland. Um, uh, they only diverged occasionally, whereas if you, if you look at the whole experience of SAGE and independent SAGE in the UK, you see uh, where the UK went wrong, which was frequently so, was the uh, unwillingness to actually uh, listen to the scientists. And I saw an interesting survey there recently in the conversation that pointed out that um, a, a survey of, of a population sample uh, reported that only 5% of people believe that the politicians should actually dictate what the response should be. And, and it's the politicians we should listen to versus 50 to 60% believing in uh, scientists. So we do have a big responsibility in as much as we're trying to articulate and report uh, science and, and the science isn't simple. Um, we, we can get it wrong, um, but it has been a success so far. Ed, that same question to you, we're coming almost to the end, but it, given that restrictions, some prefer the word protections, are by and large gone across most of Europe, um, did the virus beat us? Did it? Yes, to you, Ed, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, I actually, I think that, this, that there's been an adaptation. Um, I think we can point to different periods of time when it beat us because of a slow, a slow response in retrospect. Um, there were probably times when the, in, in some places where there was an over response that essentially wore people down and you have a, an unintended you know, um, um, you know, response to that. Um, you know, the Chinese population is very different from the American population. <laughs> you would never consider doing that, using approaches like that in the American population. But I think, you know, my Chinese friends uh, could actually, um, you know, understand it. 
Um, but this might be an example to, you know, what Rory's describing is that, well, maybe in this case, it's a matter of China not really adapting and really understanding the new science of the, of the adapting virus. Um, Anders, would you do anything differently if you were in the situation again? Yeah, I mean, it's always a, I mean, hin hindsight is a tricky thing to discuss. Of course, hopefully we do things differently if we knew more. Um, but, but I think considering what we knew at the time, uh, not hugely different, but of course we all wish that we had started in, in, in a different situation we, with a better healthcare preparedness, better preparedness in our elderly homes and, and all of those things that we really saw that this stress test to our society uh, really gave us some insights into, into big gaps in our, in our public health. Uh, and I think that's what we need to take with us. And I think two major areas that we know in Sweden we, we need to be much better at its uh, elderly care and uh, to reach the, the hard to reach parts of our populations, which are in Sweden uh, much, much bigger than many, other, many people understand. I mean, 20, 25% of the Swedish population has a birthplace outside of Sweden. And, and that gives a very heterogeneous population that you need a lot of work to, to reach in a good way. And we didn't, we hadn't, we weren't prepared to reach them quick enough. Any questions from our audience? Um, we have a couple of microphones. So if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question for any of our three panelists, just uh, put your hand up and we'll, we'll get the microphone to you. Uh, I'll just check if we have any coming in online as well. Um, not just yet. So, any, yes, thank you. If you just identify yourself, please, and direct your question. Good morning. Paul Cullen from the Irish Times. I'm a journalist. Um, thank you very much for, for the presentations. <clears throat> just two quick things uh, with two of the speakers. Professor Brewer, I was interested in, in a few comments. I just wondered if, there, if they weren't a little bit contradictory. I think you said that we were, we, we did, um, we did, we would have done quite well without legislative controls, but then you did say for the next time round we need legislation in place, so just maybe you might explore that. And just uh, Dr. Tegnell as well, if, did I understand you to say that, you, that Sweden did actually have a lockdown? You referred to a virtual lockdown. Um, I, I think you mean not in the online sense, but in the, in the almost sense, quasi sense. Um, and, and therefore, are you, do you feel that the Swedish experience has been much misrepresented um, by various uh, opinion groups? Okay. Thanks, Paul. Rory, will you just clarify the, the, the question to you, please? So my, my response was uh, in, in response to uh, Audrey's question about the, the, uh, the Swedish uh, approach, and I was just commenting on on the, that we are a very compliant uh, population. But I did then say, no, I, I, our approach was the correct approach. Something we haven't, or we touched on the importance of uh, community uh, support. Um, one thing that stands out, and, and it was uh, illustrated in our very high vaccination coverage, is uh, we, we appear to be a well-educated, well-informed populace. Um, the the media played a very responsible role. But we also, uh, Irish people don't seem to resort to misinformation on social media. Um, that's where I'm pessimistic about uh, much of the world, not, not just about COVID, but about uh, Ukraine and elsewhere. But um, but I think the substance of the answer I'd like to give, um, Paul, is, is, is around, we, we cannot uh, assume that that level of community support will always be there and, and that it will be there if, if more stringent measures are required. You know, if we were dealing with a, an organism with the pathogenicity of smallpox um, or, or extra drug resistant TB, we would have, and indeed we do have, much stronger controls that can be put in place. And we need to be doing that kind of thinking and we need to be engaging with the public, with the community, about the sorts of measures that might be needed if, if the virus, let's say SARS-CoV-3, um, has a mortality rate of 10% and uh, a transmissibility that Omicron has, we're going to have to have far more stringent measures in place. And I think we need to be having that debate, which is why I've called frequently through your newspaper, the Irish Times, uh, for a citizen as assembly to start engaging around the much worse case scenarios that could come down the road to us in the next 
five to ten years. Thank you, Rory. And Anders, if you would just, was there a quasi lockdown in Sweden and has the approach by your country been much misrepresented? Yeah, I would call it a virtual lockdown because if you look at what you're really trying to achieve with a lockdown is to try to get people to meet each other less. People in Sweden met each other a lot less, uh, as you can see by different indicators. Uh, so yes, um, if you look at that. And yes, um, the Swedish approach, for some reason, uh, has been represented as so hugely different to, to many other countries, while my understanding is it's not all that crazily different. Um, we tried to be a bit more pinpointing when we took measures, and, and instead of closing restaurants, we said that, okay, as an example, you can keep your restaurant open if you can see to it that you have social distancing in your restaurant. And uh, many restaurants were able to do that. And we actually also had uh, supervision following it up that they actually did it. And, and a few restaurants were closed who didn't do it well enough. And we can see from our data that extremely few cases can be tracked down back to restaurants in Sweden. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Uh, to Ed, to Rory and to Anners, thank you for taking part in this discussion. Well, there's lots more to come between now and one o'clock, so we're going to take a short break now, so we'll see you back again just after half past ten. Thank you. Thank you.